As we continue our Sunday morning series currently in the book of Proverbs, a series entitled, a topical study of the book of Proverbs entitled uh, Timeless Wisdom, we come this morning uh, to the subject of envy. Envy has become, I think, so prevalent in and mainstream in our culture that it's no longer uh, condemned, certainly, as a culture is sin. But I think that on a societal level, it is considered now largely harmless. And not only largely harmless, but as something that is uh, needed and something that is useful as a tool for achieving goals in uh, life. And as a result, increasingly, uh, the sin of envy does its very, very destructive work in individual lives and within a culture and within a society uh, completely undetected. Someone has said of envy, envy is the central fact of American life. And someone might say uh, in response to that, I don't know that if that is entirely true or uh, if I uh, would uh, go that far as to uh, say that. But I think most of us uh, realize that we would be very hard-pressed to try and argue against that proposition and uh, that if we did disagree, we would only disagree uh, by uh, degrees and small degrees at that. And again, I think it's perhaps the very prevalence of envy in our culture that is the explanation for the fact that it's no longer noticed or no longer detected in the way that it uh, once was, much less to be condemned or to be looked down upon as a sin. Uh, to be avoided in life. And we see it everywhere, really, if we stop and we see how pervasive envy is in our culture and to think about it. And the advertising industry, we're bombarded every day with uh, advertising which uh, openly uses the sins of covetousness and envy to sell products. Uh, envy is apparent all around us in terms of its destruction of interpersonal relationships. It lies very much at the core, uh, whether it might be motivations or whatever it might be, very much at the core of much of what is uh, social media uh, today. And worse, uh, today we have many, many politicians who now use jealousy and envy as the foundation for pitting classes of people against one another, races against one another, uh, as if any good can ever come out of trying to control or trying to manipulate something as dangerous as envy. I would contend that envy and jealousy are uh, epidemic in our culture, and epidemic and present in a way that has never been true before uh, of our nation, because increasingly, the freedoms that we enjoy in this nation, and we enjoy extraordinary freedoms uh, in this nation, but the freedoms that we enjoy in this nation are no longer governed by the biblical morality that those freedoms were intended to be founded upon, or even the biblical morality that these freedoms were founded on even a generation ago. And uh, as our second president of the United States, John Adams, who was not only the second president of the United States, but influential in the framing of uh, the Const Constitution of the United States, he rightly observed of that Constitution, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And we see the truth of that uh, all around us, on display and on parade every single day. Of course, none of this is new. Solomon wrote of the prevalence of envy in the human heart and in the human condition uh, 3,000 years ago. Uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 5, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished, and never more will they have a share in anything done under the sun. And Solomon is saying that envy is as prevalent in the human heart uh, as love and hate. 
Envy and jealousy are often referred to as the green monster. Uh, we often talk at times in our culture as someone being green uh, with envy. Uh, the ascribing of the color green to envy, uh, we owe all of that to uh, William Shakespeare, where in his play, uh, Othello, Othello's standard bearer, declares to him, Beware, my lord, of jealousy. It is a green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. I think is a further testimony to the danger of the sin uh, of envy, a danger that used to be very, very well understood uh, in, in human history, is that it even makes the list of the seven deadly sins that uh, monks put together in the fourth century as they looked at the human condition and uh, decided to come up with a list of seven things that they saw were the prevailing sins that would destroy uh, any human life and certainly keep them from uh, the life that God intends for us. And so envy finds itself on the list with lust and gluttony, greed, wrath, pride, and uh, sloth. And uh, someone has observed of this list, I think with some wit and insight, uh, of the seven deadly sins, only envy is no fun at all. And uh, that's somebody that's given some thought uh, to envy, deeper thought than is, is for the most part in our culture. Oftentimes, in terms of envy and jealousy, we use them interchangeably in our vocabulary, and there's nothing wrong at all with that, as long as we realize that as the words are used uh, in the Bible, in the Scriptures, there is a distinction between uh, the two. Jealousy is used to des uh, describe uh, the desire uh, that a person has for what uh, either someone else is or what someone else has, and the desire of that for myself, whether it be wealth or whether it be positions or whether it be uh, achievements or whether it be relationships or whether it be uh, a, a position in life, uh, and, and uh, that is jealousy. They have that, and I wish I had that. Uh, envy in a person is really jealousy on steroids. It is a resentful emotion. It is a resentful emotion of discontent. It not only desires what somebody else is and what they have, uh, but it resents the fact that they are that and they have that and I am not that and I do not have that. And, the, and with the emotion of, if I can't be that and I can't have that, then I don't want them to be that or have that uh, as, as well, that it would be taken away from them. And the envious person not only operates out of uh, covetousness, but also uh, out of deep streams of selfishness, of pride, and of self-entitlement. Uh, in, in their life. And there's hardly anything in life that is easier to manipulate in the heart of a person than selfishness and pride and a sense of self-entitlement. And we see the world, uh, the flesh and the devil working through uh, these things, working through envy uh, in such a powerful way. First, our culture nurtures envy and selfishness and pride and a sense of self-entitlement in the population, and then it proceeds to try to manipulate those very base emotions for their own agenda. Again, whether it be the pitting of one social class against another, or one race against another, or one religion against another, or uh, secular people against uh, religious people. And again, it is a very, very dangerous game to play that is being played uh, all in today in our culture, uh, given that history has uh, shown uh, envy to be a very combustible fuel. In this proverb, the word envy 
is used to represent both jealousy uh, and envy because each of them are to be equally um, avoided in our lives as Christians. I want to begin by recognizing uh, carnal envy and jealousy uh, as a sin and as something that is condemned in the Bible from one end of the Bible to the other. Allow me to uh, give a few examples in order to help us kind of uh, jar any of us out of uh, the idea that we might have uh, that of, ha of possessing any kind of a casual attitude toward uh, the sin of envy or the sin of jealousy. In Galatians chapter 5, envy uh, is put on that famous list of the Apostle Paul of the works of the flesh, along with murders and drunkenness and revelries uh, and the like. Envy is a work of the flesh. It is a work of our fallen nature. James chapter 3, verse 14, But if any of you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. And so when carnal envy uh, combines with self-seeking, uh, then uh, uh, James is saying in his own way uh, that all hell breaks loose. And why is that so? Because those are the very characteristics that mark Satan uh, at, uh, at the time in which he uh, rebelled against God and against his authority and uh, against uh, the position that God had given him uh, in the creation. Nothing can come, uh, good can come, of envy in our lives. It will only produce uh, inward uh, instability and evil. Uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 23, verse 17, Do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day, for surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 4, Wrath is cruel and anger a torrent, but who is able to stand before jealousy? In other words, as an emotion, uh, envy is as dangerous and as risky uh, to play with as wrath uh, and anger. First uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. In other words, envy will always uh, hinder our spiritual growth as Christians. Job chapter 5, verse 2. There's only 40 more. You'll be fine. Job chapter 5, verse 2. For wrath kills a foolish man, and envy slays a simple one. In other words, uh, envy is the emotion of a simpleton. Uh, it is the emotion and the trait of the ignorant. And then I think most significant of all in this regard is to remember the place that envy played uh, in the crucifixion of Jesus on that morning, that day of his uh, death. Matthew chapter 27, verse 17, And therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you, uh, Barabbas or uh, Jesus, who was called Christ? For he knew that they had handed uh, him, uh, Jesus, over because of envy. And I don't want anything uh, that played so significant a part, or any part, in the crucifixion of Jesus 2,000 uh, years ago uh, to reside in my heart or to reside in my life uh, as a Christian. Uh, anything, uh, any emotion, any trait that can operate as indiscriminately and as recklessly and can be as hate-filled as envy was uh, on that morning, we don't want it to be a part of our lives. There is absolutely nothing wrong with uh, wanting to earn more money in life, uh, to have more friends 
in life uh, or uh, to seek a promotion at work, to desire a higher standard uh, of living, and then to work hard uh, for those things in life. The problem occurs when I fall under the influence of envy or jealousy as a motivation for achieving those things in my life as opposed to just simply working hard to achieve those goals without uh, uh, either, either feel, feeling or expressing envy or jealousy of others who are in those positions uh, that, and in those places in society that I would want to be. Now, no matter how accommodating our culture becomes towards envy, uh, all of us instinctively know that it's wrong. No matter how uh, overlooked it is in our culture, we know that it's a trait uh, that is uh, uh, an embarrassment uh, to have be a part of our lives. And how can we tell that? Because we dislike it when we see it in others. And uh, we dislike it when we see it in ourselves. And the great giveaway is that uh, we work so hard uh, to keep hidden uh, this emotion or fact of, em of envy or jealousy uh, in our lives. And why do we keep it hidden? We keep it hidden because if it was known by others, uh, then it would be an embarrassment to us. The destructive nature of envy is clear in the Scriptures. Uh, it's destructive not only toward the person uh, who operates out of envy, but uh, all of those around them. We think about King Saul uh, and his jealousy of, uh, of soon-to-be King David and how envy destroyed his legacy uh, as a man and as a king and destroyed his life. Joseph's brothers in the book of Genesis uh, toward him, the envy that they showed and the destructiveness. Imagine they sought to murder their own flesh and blood under the influence of envy, sold them into slavery. I mean, you, this is not an emotion that uh, is controllable uh, in our lives in the wrong place at the wrong time. We think about the rebellion of Aaron and Miriam, the brother and sister of Moses, against his authority because of their jealousy uh, of him and his position. The jealousy of Korah and Dathan and I, uh, Abiram uh, concerning uh, the positions that God had given to Moses and get, had given to uh, Aaron and how uh, ultimately it resulted in the death of themselves, their entire families, and everyone who aligned with them in this jealousy jealous, envious rebellion against the authority of, of Moses. We think on an individual level how ugly uh, Sarah, beautiful woman, beautiful saint and sister in the Old Testament, but there's no hiding the ugliness uh, of that season of her jealousy uh, represented in her treatment of Hagar. And again, to say nothing of the envy uh, involved in Satan and his fall. Historically, envy, the danger of envy, uh, used to be uh, widely recognized, even apart from uh, the Scriptures. And uh, everybody had uh, a, a, an awareness, anybody that knew anything about history, anybody who had any kind of self-awareness uh, at, at all or any kind of life experience at all uh, recognized uh, the uselessness and the danger uh, of envy. Uh, one uh, uh, political leader said, the spirit of envy can only destroy, it can never uh, build, and that's the truth of it. Uh, someone else has said, envy is the most stupid of vices, for there is no single advantage to be gained from it. Uh, someone else has said, envy is the coward side of hate, and all her ways are bleak and desolate. Someone else has said, do not spoil what you have by desiring what you uh, uh, what, do not spoil what you have by desiring what you have not. 
Now, in this proverb that that we read here, Solomon makes clear the destructiveness of envy in our lives. You notice his use of the word rottenness. It is a rot. It is the introduction of rottenness into a human life. And the word rotten, in the original language, it literally means rotten. And uh, it also means decay. And so uh, each of those words, rottenness, decay, it speaks of something rotting or decaying over a long period of time. So you picture in your mind uh, a bowl of fruit, maybe some hundred plus days uh, degrees of weather comes up in the summer, and here is fruit that goes bad in the bowl before we can uh, even uh, eat all of it, and it becomes mushy and moldy. Uh, Or you might think in your mind of a, a body slowly breaking down in a grave, and that is what envy and jealousy produces in a human life. It produces physical and emotional and mental and physical and spiritual rot and decay. And, uh, uh, And envy is absolutely incapable of producing anything good in our lives. It is only capable of destroying what is good Uh, in our lives. Someone has said, the jealous are troublesome to others, but they are a torment uh, to themselves. And that's precisely the point that Solomon is making here. Envy will always break down a person's physical health, uh, our emotional health, our mental health, and certainly our spiritual health as well. You notice that Solomon mentions bones, and so he speaks about, <clears throat> this speaks about uh, the inner harm or the inner damage that, uh, that envy does in a person, that eats a person up from the inside uh, out. Just because we're able to for a time, not indefinitely ever, but because a person is able to hide it within our hearts, keep it from uh, coming out overtly and being seen by others, it doesn't mean that it isn't continuing to do tremendous damage uh, inside of our our lives. We notice Solomon's use of the word is, and you're saying to yourself, don't tell me he is going to break down the verse all the way down to the is. Yes, I am. And so, and the idea of using that word is there is that this is not what envy might be. It is not what envy could become in our lives, but this is what envy always is, without exception. It is rottenness uh, to our bones. Now, to allow me to lay out a number of things that become uh, immediate casualties of envy in our lives, and uh, if we allow envy to abide within us. One of the very first casualties of envy in our lives is peace, uh, because with envy, I begin to view everyone else in life as a competitor uh, or even as an enemy in my life. And uh, because everyone in the world is going to be uh, better at us in at least one thing, if not several uh, things in terms of we, uh, than we are, if I refuse to accept that fact of life, then I'm going to be doomed to live a life of perpetual envy. There are people that are just better at certain things than we are. But we are better at other things than, than they are. But without recognizing that, envy keeps us in that <clears throat> terrible place. Envy robs us of joy in our lives. It's impossible to be envious and to be joyous or to be happy at the same uh, time. And of course, one of the great joys in life is to see other people be blessed, to see their accomplishments, to see their accomplishments recognized and rewarded. And the inability to enjoy that related to other people takes a massive uh, source of joy uh, out of our lives. 
Envy also destroys thankfulness in our lives because our eyes are always on what we don't have and we want rather than on all of the things that we do have. As I mentioned early, envy, earlier, envy will always stunt <clears throat> our spiritual growth. It will always stunt our emotional growth and our intellectual uh, growth. When someone is more accomplished or more mature than us in some area of life, whether it is in the natural realm or the spiritual realm, the solution is never to become jealous uh, of them, but to learn from them, to make them an inspiration, uh, to make them an example in my life in order to spur us on then to become like that ourselves. But the easy way, uh, the cheap way, is just to become uh, envious. And so we hide behind our insecurities and we convince ourselves that we are some kind of uh, a victim. And when we do, now envy becomes this very powerful, very self, uh, much self-imposed barrier to self-improvement and to personal growth. It is always easier on the short term to consider myself to be a victim in life than to actually better myself and then to determine to become or achieve uh, what I envy in others or constantly telling myself that the fact that they've gotten more or they've achieved more can't be because they're actually better than me in certain areas uh, of life or more talented than I am or more hardworking than I am or more disciplined than I am. No, it always has to be something wrong with them because it can't be wrong with me. And envy puts us in that place where we're doomed to never grow out of that. And, uh, and that is a very <coughs> constricted place to live. I think that a couple of quotes are helpful in this regard. Um, one man uh, said this, really excellent. <clears throat> he said, no man is a complete failure until he begins disliking men who succeed. That is a wonderful quote. Uh, no man is a complete failure until he begins disliking men who succeed. Now I'm a complete failure because I will never rise out of that if that's where I choose to abide. Somebody said, worth begets uh, in base minds envy, in great souls emulation. And Shakespeare, uh, you always have to close it off with Shakespeare or C.S. Lewis. But Shakespeare said of this, and oft my jealousy shapes faults that are not. As somebody else has put it, nothing sharpens sight like envy. <laughs> uh, it m makes us notice uh, every uh, kind of fault in another person, even faults that aren't faults. And sooner or later, Envy will almost always turn into that fault-finding and slandering uh, of, <clears throat> of people. Again, another quote, slander is the only way some have uh, of feeling close to accomplishment. And uh, there's a lot of people who sit uh, at uh, computer keyboards all day, every day that prove the truth uh, of that. Over the long haul, envy will result in a life of isolation. Ultimately, envy will drive away every healthy relationship from our lives, every healthy uh, influence in our lives, until the only people who can stand to be around us are those who are uh, equally destroying their lives under the influence of, of envy. And then worse of all in terms of the consequences of envy. It has the potential to grieve the Holy Spirit uh, in my life. And that's the worst isolation a person can ever experience. A Christian is that isolation from God by the grieving of the Holy Spirit. At the root of 
<clears throat> all envy in a Christian's life, despite all of uh, our protests to the contrary, uh, might be, is a distrust of God. It is a failure to recognize that each and every one of us are unique in human history. God has made us the way that He has made us. He has put us in the positions that He has put us in life uh, as, as uh, expertly and as carefully as He places any foreign missionary uh, in the world and that God has a plan for our lives that one day are going to result in hearing, well done thou good and faithful servant upon entering into heaven. And as we just commit ourselves to being what God has called us to be, where he's called us to be that uh, individually, and then fulfilling what God has called us to be individually in the world. It's like the plaque uh, I saw in Sonoma uh, long, uh, long ago up in a shop, and it said, be yourself, everyone else is taken. And that is very, very true um, in uh, the kingdom of God uh, as, as well. And then to just trust that the life that God has intended for us is truly the best life that we can live. It far exceeds any life that we could envy from someone else or any life that envy could ever lead us uh, into. There's no better life uh, than the life that God has planned for us. And... Uh, <clears throat> And, uh, it's, uh, and that the life that God has for us to live. Envy is an indication uh, that I think there is something better than the life that God has uh, planned for me. If someone were to ask us, if you could ask for and receive anything, uh, whatever you wanted uh, in life above all else, uh, what would it be? You can formulate your own question, and uh, we'll have free cars out in the parking lot if that's your answer. No, for, for a Christian, and for a Christian who um, has walked with the Lord for a while, five minutes or longer, uh, the correct answer to that that question would be to be in the very will of God. If there's one thing you could have in life, what would it be? To walk in the will of God for my life and to know that I'm in His will. And what good is everything else that we might be able to gain in life if we don't have that confidence? And what a confidence is ours, what a satisfaction, what meaning and purpose marks our lives when we realize my life for all I have or don't have that God chooses to bring into my life, my life is being lived in His will. I'm living the life that He intends for me, which is the very best life that I can individually uh, live. Envy is not only a sin against others and a sin against myself, but it is also a sin against God. Solomon presents the solution, and I close with this, the solution to jealousy and envy in our lives, and it's in the earlier part of uh, the verse. A sound heart is uh, life to the body, and then you notice that next word, but. So he's contrasting uh, the two here, and he's telling us that the first part is the solution to the second part. And uh, uh, and, he, and, and that's how he uh, presents that. A sound heart is, uh, that is a healthy uh, inner man, uh, including our mental, our emotional, and spiritual well-being. It begins with a recognition that envy is a uh, sin, and a sin that needs to be confessed uh, to God, a bias it as, occur, as it occurs in our lives, and then just and then to couple that with repentance to turn from it and to ask for God's uh, forgiveness. And so we recognize <clears throat> uh, 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 that we recognize no matter how much 
Envy is nurtured and cultivated within our culture, uh, that we will not accept that as something that God has uh, for our lives. The second thing that's important as a solution to envy is to recognize that like any other sin, it will destroy us. It will destroy us if, it we, if we leave it unattended and unaddressed. Third, to always be uh, reading the Word of God. The Word of God, James says, is a mirror. Uh, it, it, when we look into the mirror of God's Word, um, it shows us uh, who we really are. And the word, is, it, it, the word of God is unlike anything else in the world. It will always give us a, an accurate uh, assessment of ourselves, unlike uh, uh, Barney or Aunt B uh, or Andy or any of the other characters in Andy of Mayberry. These are the, all of my illustrations are old. And, uh, but it, and it will, and the wonderful thing about the word is, is, is we're, uh, reading the word on a, a daily basis, it will, uh, it will be faithful to even expose sins in our lives that work so hard to hide themselves uh, in, in our uh, lives and uh, uh, like envy. And it's the only thing in the world that does that. And then fourth, to pray. Just to ask God, God, show me every time I'm envious in life. I don't want this to have a foothold in my life so that I can become aware of it in this culture that is so given to it and, uh, and, uh, and, and then turn away from it. And then fifth, just to continually ask God to refill us with the fullness of his Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of reasons that's important, but one of the reasons is, is that the fruit of the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote to the Galatians, is that is love. And it's in that great list of that fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians uh, chapter 5. And a love for God and a love for our fellow man uh, is, is important because envy, carnal envy, cannot survive in an environment of love. Lo envy always exists um, as a, a revelation of the fact that I need to grow in love and my love for God and my love for my fellow man and to ask God to produce that within my life. And then six, to just humble myself and to mortify the deeds of the flesh, including uh, envy, as Paul uh, uh, put it. And, and the word mortify the deeds of the flesh, as Paul wrote, uh, it means to cold-blooded murder, show envy no mercy, in our lives and the power uh, of, of the Holy Spirit. And I think that the best way to cold-blooded murder envy in my life is to pray for God to bless even more the person that I envy and in the area of their life that I envy. And it is... a uh, it will wilt on the vine uh, under the weight of that kind of intercession. And then seventh, just to find contentment in God's will, to be satisfied with how God has made us, how he has gifted us, where he's put us in life, his plan for our lives. And, I, I, and, and as you know, once a person begins to um, it, it lives in that place of God's will for our lives, and then we explore it, we enjoy it, we are living it, and it, we find it to be so perfect for us, so satisfying uh, for us that we won't want to trade places with anyone else uh, in life because of what is happening between us and God uh, in the midst of, uh, of that uh, of his will for our lives. And so this prevalent, prevalent sin that is within our lives, one that will destroy us, God has a much greater path for us. And this wonderful single proverb right there in the middle of the book of Proverbs that warns us related to it, but then also tells us how to live a life uh, that is uh, free from this terrible 
a terrible curse in our culture uh, and in life. Let's stand together now and we'll close in prayer. Father, in this series, and we see it all the way through the, the book of Proverbs, um, this wisdom is timeless wisdom, but it can also be ignored wisdom, certainly ignored in our culture. And we thank you for the time just to immerse in this for a little while here today, to allow it to search our lives that it might cease any destructive work that it's doing in our lives and then doing to all of the relationships around us in life, to eradicate this poison from our lives. We thank you that you have given us the ability by your Holy Spirit to live a life that is content in you content in your plan for our lives and is able to rejoice in how you bless others in a completely different calling, in a completely different place. Thank you for the freedom that your Holy Spirit has brought into our lives and the privilege of being able to walk in that freedom. And we thank you this morning, Lord, for the, in the name of the one who made all of it possible. In Jesus' name, amen.